Good afternoon, Mamta. How are you? Hi, how are you? Good, good. Good to see you. It's good to be here. Good. So I'm actually going to um, yield the floor to you and have you, um, you know, give our students a quick welcoming remarks before we jump into our presentation. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm so grateful to you. Hi everyone, it's good to see all of you that I can see and just seeing everyone's names, it just warms my heart. Um, I'm, you know, I, I came to this uh, preceptorial because I, I need to navigate some of this stuff in myself. <laughs> so um, I wanna welcome all of you, but I'm hoping I can, I, I wanted to be a learner alongside you in this journey because um, some of you know this, but um, I just want to, again, introduce myself. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Mumta Akapati, and I, I'm starting at Penn. And my um, today is day 10 on my job as the Vice Provost for University Life. And I, y'all, ki I kid you not, and my, I'm from Texas, so my Texan accent comes out sometimes. Um, every day I get up in the morning and I'm like, oh my gosh, am I smart enough to do this job? And so every day I'm like, all these students are so, you know, all of you are so brilliant. And like, how can I, you know, how am I going to honor you and keep up with you? And um, am I smart enough for you? Um, and so I'm just grappling with a lot of these um, issues around navigating my own stuff around imposter syndrome, right? Like, and so I just, I, I'm grateful to be here. Um, welcome, I want to welcome all of you, but I'm joining you on this journey as a learner um, learning from you and alongside you. And I'm just grateful that you're allowing me to be in this space with you. Thank you so much, Mom, for, the, um, well, for, for those uh, welcoming remarks. So now I can share the screen. And so like, you know, Mom kind of mentioned this, but we want this session to be a, a session where we can practice, you know, reflective thinking. We can think about, you know, reflect on our own personal and professional experiences. Um, and then towards the end, we want this to be a very conversational type of, you know, uh, presentation. Um, so as I'm going through various slides and share with you some information, do think about, you know, where you stand with this, you know, with the, uh, with the content that we are providing you with. And then if you have any notes or questions um, or something resonates with you, be sure to use the, um, the chat um, the, the chat um, um, uh, portion of this recording to share your thoughts with us. So for today's agenda, we're going to be talking about what is imposter syndrome and different types of imposter syndrome that students or people in general experience, um, thoughts and feelings associated with imposter syndrome, um, the imposter circle and what does that look like and how it can impact us mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and sometimes even physically. Um, those individuals that are impact, who are impacted by, you know, imposter syndrome, um, challenges with overcoming the, the feeling of imposter syndrome and ways in which we can use various coping mechanisms or best practices to sometimes either diminish this feeling or um, do our best to get rid of it. And now we're going to transition to the culture of PAN uh, and the way in which PAN, you know, helps our students to overcome those imposter syndrome feelings. And then, we'll just, and then we'll provide you guys with a case study to read over. Um, and then once the case study is over, we're gonna do some reflexive practice. Um, so that way you guys can uh, potentially think about some of, the some of the coping mechanisms that we have identified and apply it to your own you know, uh, personal experiences. So what is imposter syndrome? If imposter syndrome is an intense feeling that others have um, a perception of your ability, right? We tend to think that we, you know, uh, that we're not good enough, but then we tend to think that others may see us differently. So it's about a perception that we have, um, that people have of us. And sometimes those perceptions are tend to be seen in a negative context. Those people that, you know, who also experience imposter syndrome are convinced that they are incapable or do not deserve the success that they have achieved. Um, so they tend to think that, you know what, I'm at this institution, uh, you know, because I got lucky. Or sometimes we don't even give ourselves the credit that we deserve for the, for the work that we have done in order to achieve, you know, uh, greatness. And, 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 and sometimes when we do achieve greatness, we don't give ourselves enough credit, but we tend to give attribution to our external uh, factors that contribute to what we have experienced. There's also, there also, there's also evidence of success that, that label them as, as luck, timing, or making others think that you are 
more competent or intelligent than what you than what you really are, right? We say that I've been able to accomplish this because the timing of it was right, or because of my status of my identity, the university selected me because I'm contributing to the diversity status. Um, or sometimes we think we tend to we make others think that we are, you know, have a level of certain of intelligence. Um, but in but in reality, some, we we downplay how much we know about the uh, the content that we're learning about our major or about life experiences. But a lot of times, it's not just the students who who experience this imposter syndrome. In fact, seventy percent of people you know um, in the world tend to experience some sort of imposter syndrome at, at least at one time in their you know lifetime. And so it is. This is uh, very common amongst many people. And you know, sometimes we have even people experiencing imposter syndrome without knowing that, they're, that they have those feelings. And, and, with the, and, and in here, uh, imposter syndrome also contributes about how much we think that we know um, about you know, life in general, about our academics, about the knowledge that are being presented to us. And we tend to think that we don't know enough. But then we also often tend to think that people outside of our circle tend to know a lot more than we do. So we, so there's always this level of comparison between ourselves and others, which then prevents us from running our own race. I always say to people, including myself, to run your own race because we all come from different walks of life, different experiences. We have different, you know, um, upbringings, and so it is not fair for you to compare yourself to others. What you know is based off of your own personal experiences. And in fact, um, I always tell people that if you are a first generation and lower income students, you tend to know a lot about life because you have experienced so many obstacles and you have learned so many different lessons from those experiences. So don't ever limit yourself and your knowledge and don't try to compare your own um, experience your knowledge with others because we all have come from different walks of life and experiences. So there are five different types of imposter syndromes, right? So as I give definitions to these different five types, I want you guys to think about where you may fall within these categories. The first one is called the perfectionist. Um, the, and, and, and somebody who's a perfectionist is never satisfied and always feels as though they have to work, they have to uh, work hard to achieve, you know, greater things. Rather than focusing on your strength, they, uh, people tend to, you know, fixate on their flaws and their mistakes, which then, which this leads to self, um, self pressure and anxiety. And again, some of you may identify with more of, you know, with more than one category of imposter syndrome, or that, or that you may find yourself you know, navigating through various stage, various stages of your um, pen experience and experiencing different types of imposter syndrome. The next one is about is called the superheroes. Um, because these people feel, uh, you know, inadequate, they feel compelled to push through and to work as hard as possible to achieve whatever it is in, on their agenda to achieve. Um, and again, these feelings tend to lead to, you know, anxiety, self-isolation, and stress. Then we have the expert. These are the individuals who are always trying to learn, um, trying to learn more and are never satisfied with their accomplishment or with the level of understanding. Even though these people are not satisfied with the level of understanding, they often are highly skilled and they underrate their, their expertise in specific fields, right? So again, it's important for you to, uh, to stay in your lane, know what you know and acknowledge what you don't know and find ways to increase your learning in that specific area. Then we have the natural genius. These people are excessively um, you know, set soft goals for themselves, and they feel crushed when they don't, you know, reach those goals. And, and again, this is somebody who uh, can also be seen as a perfectionist. We tend to see others and, and see what type of goals and aspirations they have set them for themselves. And then we tend to measure our own goals compared to them. But in reality, again, um, your level of success is going to be look very different from the person's next to you. So when you set unrealistic or sometimes you know left, uh, um, um, lofty goals for yourself and you don't achieve them, you tend to look down upon yourself and think that you are not good enough. And then lastly, we have the socialist, and these people tend to be individual individualistics who prefer to work in isolation or who prefer to work alone. Um, their self um, um, their self worth are often stem from productivity. So 
um, they often reject getting assistance because they see you know, receiving help or um, asking for help is a sign of weakness. But in reality, we don't, we don't know everything that there is in education uh, in, in coming to college, especially if you are a first generation student, this is your first time entering an environment that is very unfamiliar to you. So unless you ask questions, you won't have access to resources or answers that can help you to be more successful. So different thoughts and feelings that are associated with imposter syndrome are that we experience a lot of self-doubt, that we tell ourselves, oh my God, I can't do this. I don't belong here. I'm not made out for this. Without even giving ourselves a chance to try certain things, we tend to self-select ourselves out of the situation because we have all of these negative thoughts circulating in our, in our mind. We tend to question our accomplishments. Who am I to be actually attending an IV institution? Like, did I get here by mistake? Did somebody just felt that you know, was having a good day and say, you know what, let me admit the students? No, you got here because you have demonstrated that you can not only handle the rigor of your academics, but that you have great skills and, and you have, and you have um, a high level of competency to do the work and to be a successful student on campus. Um, people tend to berate their you know, the performance that I just got away with it this time, that the next time they're gonna, they're gonna catch me in my mistakes. Again, we don't give ourselves enough credit um, that we deserve in order for us to know that, yes, we are capable of performing at a high level. And yes, we are able to compete at a high level with our peers who are non-first generation students. We tend, people tend to fear that they won't live up to the expectations, that next time they'll call me out or they will say that, you know what, you know, you made a mistake. And then once they experience success, they attribute those success to external factors. Um, and a, an example of this is that when we have students who perform extremely well in their classes, instead of saying that, you know what, I have worked hard and I have received the A that I have, you know, earned, they tend to say, I got an A or I got an A minus because the professor was an easy grader. But they fail to recognize that, no, I have put in the work that is required. I have sacrificed you know, um, some social events or some personal time to make sure that I spend a quality amount of time in my studies to perform at a high level. And then again, we tend to be overachievers and this is by nature, right? Because we wanna to tend to um, uh, portray this, this level of you know, persona to others that we are uh, capable of doing the, unth doing the unthinkable. However, sometimes when, you, when we tend to compare ourselves to others, that means that we are doing things to, uh, to make other people happy or satisfied, and, we're, and then we are um, not giving ourselves a chance to do the things that we enjoy doing. And that can all create a, a high level of anxiety and uh, tend, to let us, tend to let us to live on the edge. So what is the imposter circle? So, the, so when people go through this um, cyclical model of imposter circle, they go through various stages where they are looking for some sort of validation, but then the validation tends to be uh, short-lived. So they start at the top with feeling not good enough, that again, I'm not good enough to be here, I'm not smart enough, I can't do this. So they have all of these negative thoughts, then they move towards the why. They find every or, or any excuse that they can find that leads to them feeling not good enough or that they don't belong into a specific community. Once they have identified those, you know, uh, those excuses, then they create a target. And this target can be anything that they can obtain by working hard. It could be an award, it could be a certificate, it could be a kudos or some kind of a compliment from their peers or from the professors, which there's nothing wrong with that. However, so, um, those, tend to, those targets tend to be um, you know, short-lived. Once they have um, identified the target, now they are working towards achieving that target, right? So they're more so are focusing on the end result as opposed to the journey in which they're gonna be traveling towards. Once they work hard you know, to, achieve the, uh, to achieve that goal or target, they still feel as though, you know what, I'm not, I, I don't feel good enough. I still feel as though I can do more. And then they tend to have you know, these negative feelings with a small or slight sense of hope of achievement or greatness. Then they move towards the achievement target, right? They have, they have, they have um, achieved this target, they have obtained the goal, they may have received the certificate of, of completion or they, have, they may have received um, a compliment from a, from a professor. But again, that 
that end result, because it's monetary, it is short-lived, right? So once we experience that, that experience or that feeling of um, pleasure may last for about a week, may last for about a month, maybe a semester. But at some point, it's going to diminish its feeling. Then it brings us back to almost at the beginning stage of the circle, right? The glow wears off and the feelings of anxiety, stress, pressure, that you're not good enough, as, and as we call it, the, the imposter, it comes back to us. So now they have to go through this entire circle once more. The only difference is that now there's an added level of pressure, there's, a lab, there's an added level of um, anxiety added to the next you know, uh, uh, cycle. And that can all create a very tense amount of emotion, feelings for students, um, and that can lead to a lot, of, a lot more uh, anxiety and depression. So now I'm going to ask my colleague, Toys, to talk about those who are impacted by imposter syndrome. Thank you, Hata. And so um, those, you've already heard from different administrators here who said that they are affected by it, but it affects everybody. Athletes, artists, seasoned professionals, recent graduates, parents, and students, nobody is immune to this. And so by saying that, we normalize it. So it's not the question of, if I'm going to, you know, feel imposter syndrome, it's kind of a question of when. And so if we know something's coming, then that's a good thing because then we can prepare and we can decide how we're going to meet this challenge head on. And so that's what we want to do with this presentation is to help you know how to recognize that and what to do to move forward. So we're all susceptible. You know, I think of some great one, you can Google this yourself and see, you know, who are some famous folks who um, have had to deal with this. And I think of, um, I saw that it was, Maya Angelou, the great poet and activist, you know, she, there's a quote that I found that she said, you know, she published 11 books and then she was having one more come out and she thought, oh my goodness, people are going to find out I'm a fraud because she wasn't feeling so confident about that book. But even she was feeling uh, this way about her work and what she's done. And we can look and see about all the accomplishments that she has uh, made and the accolades and things she's overcome. So none of us are immune from this. Thank you. Next slide. Thanks. So before we go into looking at talking about the specific uh, challenges overcoming this, I do want to acknowledge that many of us in the Figley community, we do come from homes and families, from communities, from traditions and cultures possibly, where it's not the norm to talk about feelings, where it's not acceptable to talk about some of these topics that we're going to talk about in the next few slides. And I was one of those people where my family, yeah. we didn't talk about these things outside of the family or even outside of me. That wasn't something that was modeled to me. And so I will ask you, for those of you who are in that situation, to stay with me with this. And I promise we can see where we can come to at least some type of revolution, resolution to help you see. But the first one is self-doubt. That's the big challenge you heard uh, Hatev talk about, self-doubt and self-worth. Sometimes self-doubt is tied to confidence. And self-worth is usually the inter your inherent value of you. Sometimes in our lives, something has shaken that confidence and we tend to want to self-doubt, whether it be of our control or not of our control. A lot of times some things that happen to us, we don't have control over that, but it does shake our confidence. And then our value, you know, it's not necessarily what you can do or your talents, but it's you as a living, breathing human being on this earth. You have value, you matter. And if we can stick with that and you can move forward and look through the rest of these things, then you can know that you have confidence. You can have that value. But that's the important piece there. If those pieces aren't there, and as we move to the right with this, we're going to see that when you have, you know, if you think of on a continuum, I don't know if you can see me here, but, you, you know, we don't want to be too high when we're just happy all the time and then too low when we're just low here. But we want to have that middle, that balance there. And so when we're coming low when we're not having feeling so confident and we're not feeling our value for whatever reason, then we start to believe the self-talk in our mind, right? That self-talk that says that success is, that the success we experience is fake, right? I got into pen, but maybe this, this, and that, those feelings start to infiltrate and we start believing that because our self-worth and self-doubt has been hindered or hurt. Uh, we start to believe that because I feel inadequate, because I feel inadequate, therefore I am inadequate, right? No, that's not the case. Just because you feel some way isn't always the truth. And sometimes when we have that self-doubt or that, um, that negative talk, it's thinking that we did 99 things correctly, 
But then that one thing that maybe we didn't do correctly or didn't go the way the plan, that negative self-talk will just eat at us. And we start believing all those things. We start self-sabotaging ourselves because we don't believe, we believe all the things we hear in our heads. And so because we are just in our head, then we're not willing to talk about these feelings. If you just stay in your mind with all these feelings of the, of the self-doubt, the self-worth, negative self-talk, if you don't get those feelings out, then all you have is yourself and self it's in your head. You need to get those out. So if we don't talk about, if you're not willing to acknowledge that, what you're feeling and thinking inside, then you can't deal with it. And then if you can't acknowledge and uh, deal with those feelings, then you don't address those triggers and the, the sensitivities that you have, right? So when you think about what are those triggers and sensitivities, you think about sometimes there's people in our lives, right? Sometimes that um, for whatever reason, you know, they uh, when you see them, maybe you think of their name, maybe it's a figure, and they just kind of, they trigger you to thinking some type of way, maybe it's a bad feeling, they get some negative feeling. And we all have that in our lives. Well, it's the same way with, with interactions, the same way in that how we uh, move through life, um, that there are those things that happen. So you have to ask yourself, you know, what happened that caused me to feel this way? What am I thinking? And how does this make me feel, right? So the thinking and the feeling, that's, that's the connection there. And so then if we move to the next one, we're saying not using our coping mechanisms. If our self-doubt is low, if our self-value, we're not feeling that way, if we're believing all this negative self-talk, and we're not willing to share with others, I'm feeling this way, I'm hurting, and we're not willing, and then we, we had a trigger or sensitivity, it sends us lower, then if we had some coping strategies, if we had some ways that would help us deal with this, then we can't use them. And so it, it hinders us from overcoming so you can see how it builds and builds and builds. And so there's places in there that we need to help uh, to help ourselves with. Next slide, please. So coping mechanisms, mechanisms, here we go. So again, sometimes uh, we come from cultures and families and uh, traditions that we that tells us it's not a good thing to acknowledge our feelings, but it is. I wanna say that it's helpful to me when I say things that loud. For some reason, when it's in my mind, that's all I have, right? There's no, there's nobody in there to tell me yes or no. I'm just within myself. But when I acknowledge it, when I just even say it out loud, I can hear it and it reads differently with me. And when I share my feelings with somebody else, someone else is able to parrot that back to me. You know, I'll give you a, a, a big secret about um, counselors or things. You know, one of the, the, the things that a, count, a good counselor will do is they don't give you advice. They don't tell you what to do. Basically, they pair it back with what you're saying because for some reason, when someone else says exactly what you just said, it just sounds differently. It doesn't resonate with you. And you're like, did I just say that about myself? So it's a great thing to get those feelings out, to acknowledge those and to talk with them because most of the time, they aren't true, right? And that leads us into the next one, the evidence. So I was talking about um, what happened, what's the thought, what's the feeling, you know, um, you have to look through that and get your evidence. If I'm feeling like um, that I don't belong, that I'm a fraud, that I don't need to be here, well then wh what's my evidence there? And remember, evidence is facts. It's not based on thoughts and it's not based on feelings. It's based on facts. So what are those facts? You know, so even now I can do that right here. You know, I'm giving, what is happening? I'm giving a presentation. What am I thinking? Well, I'm thinking, you know, Hitesh did a really great job. Hitesh he knew how he said words that I didn't even understand. He, his transitions were flawless, you know? So then what does it make me feel like? It makes me feel like, well, maybe I don't do with that great of job. Um, I can't do well. And then I start thinking into believing all these ways. But then if I think about, well, what's the evidence choice? What's the evidence that says that you can't be a great presenter? What's the evidence that says I'm not a good student? What's the evidence that says that I don't belong at 10? What's the evidence? And I think when we start, looking at that list, we're not going to have very many things. We're going to find that it's just thought, it's just these, these ideas in our mind that aren't true. And we have to make sure we can come out of that. So again, coming to the self-talk, acknowledge your growth. Oh my goodness. And have grace and compassion. You know, many of you here are experiencing transition from high school to college, much like um, the transition you made from eighth grade to ninth grade from fifth grade to uh, sixth grade, for some of those transitions, you had to go to a completely different school, right? 
And you never knew how to do middle school. You never knew how to do college because you know, now you don't know. You don't know how to do college and college at 10, right? So acknowledge that you are in a transition. You're not going to know everything and that's okay. And that positive self-talk to remember these facts here that this is why I'm feeling this way and have that grace and compassion with yourself that remember your value. Remember your, that you, you are worth something. You are worth. You have worth right, in this world, on this earth, and to, you know, sometimes when we, uh, when we help out our friends or family members, we have so much grace and compassion for them, don't we, when they're come, when they're, when they're having problems or issues, and we can tell them, oh, no, you do this well, oh, no, you do that well, but then when we put a mirror in front of ourselves, for some reason, we don't have that same grace and compassion, and that's just a human thing, but we need to start moving towards, yes, I, I I have done these things. I do. I can do well. I have made it here. This is what I can do. So acknowledge that. And then the perspective. This is such a good one. Oh my goodness, perspective, right? Because what is your focus? You know, when you think about the computer or anything, um, you know, if you just focus on just a little piece here, it's kind of hard to tell what's happening. But if you come out a little bit, you know, zoom out. And then you can kind of get a better context, but it's when you come completely out that you can see the bigger picture, whether it be looking at a paper, a picture, a map, right? So what is your focus? If you are fixating on just the one thing that of the 99 things that you did correctly, you need to rethink what is my focus and what is my journey here, right? We're all on a journey, a life journey here. What is your journey here at 10? Was your journey to come here to get two marks about the next person sitting next to you? Or was your journey here to take a risk and expand your mind? You know, all this week I've been listening to alumni, Figley alumni. I've been listening to Figley students, uh, recent graduates who have been telling amazing stories about their journey. And they talk about some of the most pivotal times is when they had failures. The most pivotal time was when they made a misstep. The most pivotal time was when they took a risk and did something that nobody else was doing that everybody said don't do maybe or something. And then it was incredible strength that I saw in their voice, in their story, and it made them to who they are now. So again, when we cope with this, thinking again, acknowledging um, the growth, what is your focus? Your focus is here to learn. And some of the best teaching tools that I know that anybody here can say are the times when we did have to contemplate and think what is what was happening here and move forward and get up and pick ourselves up. So it's acknowledging our feelings, recognizing those thoughts and triggers, positive self-talk, acknowledging your growth, having grace and compassion. And what is your focus here? What is your journey? Some folks talked about here the static this week about you're gonna have to channel out the static, all this outside noise and focus on you and what you want here at Penn, what you want your life, how you want that to go, right? So think of those things. Next slide. Ah, culture at pin. So we can have all these wonderful, lovely coping mechanisms, but we can think about the culture at pin. So I'm not gonna dwell too much on these because I know we have some friends who are gonna share, but the professional culture, and this is, I heard this from words from students uh, within the last month. They said, this is something where um, everyone already knows exactly what they will do after graduation, that everybody already acts and dresses like they're a CEO at pin that everybody already has their internship, everybody already has their professional network on day one or even now, and that they already know what they're going to do. They already have it plotted out. And then the student said, and then I'm just here. I'm just happy to be here. I'm just ready just to get in Math 104, right? And so feeling that professional culture and that pressure there. And the other one is pen face. That's when um, students put a look on that everything is fine that they're not, they're not struggling with anything, with anything that uh, everything is fine and dandy, that uh, they're just, there's no struggle anywhere in their life, when in fact, that's not the case, that everybody has a struggle. Everybody's struggle doesn't look the same. We don't know what everybody's feeling behind. Remember, when we're in our own head, there's a lot of things happening there, and so that's 10 phase. And so I think our friends are going to share a little bit more about that as we move forward. Next slide, case study. All right, so Hatab, do you want to help us know how we do? You want me just to read through this and then we can have a talk about it or what? 
All right, so let's go ahead and read through this. And we're gonna, after this, we're gonna go through the mechanisms that we went through and maybe see um, how we can uh, handle this. So it says, Alex is an accomplished violinist who sat first chair throughout high school and has won numerous awards, including state honors and recognition. Alex has been accepted in a little tender college known for its prestigious music program. Uh, some students who graduate from this prestigious school become renowned musicians. Alex has been playing since they were five years old, and while they enjoy the violin, composition and arrangement also interest them. On the first day of class, Alex is enamored with the ability of a junior who played the introduction of an arrangement the class will learn for the semester. Alex's excitement quickly turns to mental anguish, fear, and they begin to wonder why they were accepted into the school. As Alex begins to practice on their own, they, can, they can't stop thinking about the skill and talent of the students they heard in class. They are unable to complete the practice session. Alex calls a close friend to talk about how they are feeling, and the friend reminds Alex of their gifted music of musical ability. After the phone call, Alex thinks the friend was just telling them what they wanted to hear. Alex feels like a fraud and starts to wonder if they have even musical talent at all. So this is a very real, um, a very real scenario, right? And so let's think about how can we help Alex? Because Alex could be me, Alex could be you, Alex could be a family member friend. How can we help Alex? So the next slide, we're going to look at re this reflective practice. So Alex is acknowledging, so acknowledging <laughs> feeling. Well, let's go backwards actually, because I like to think about. Um, Going back, but let's think about. Um, let's see, I don't have my chat open. So let's see. All right. So when we think about what would be helpful for Alex to know from perspective, right? So Alex is very deep into this perspective. How can we use that? Perspective would be able to, to, to show Alex that, hey, so if you help Alex with the perspective, Alex needs to see that. Okay, wait, here we go. I'm sorry, <laughs> I right, let's get on that one. Alex said that it didn't deserve to get, Alex said I didn't deserve to get into all state. All right, Vernon, I'm kind of, I'm kind of tracing with you. Don't even know. Lauren comes in, Alex says I couldn't perform at Carnegie. Okay. So we can see, so these are both great what you're talking about. So giving Alex perspective and that he's looking at just one incident, right? One incident. And he's basing everything off this one incident. So we can even go back to that mechanism about what's the evidence, right? This is a great moment to say, what's the evidence? What is the evidence, Alex? It was just a feeling, right? Did anybody tell? Did, did, did anybody, was there any concrete facts that says Alex is a fraud, that Alex is not deserving to be there? Was there any facts anywhere in that uh, scenario that would say Alex is a fraud? No, I would say no, that would be my answer, no. Alex is not uh, a fraud there. And then we can see that Alex has a lot of this self-doubt, right? Something happened, what happened? He just heard uh, this junior play you know, wonderfully this piece, but what maybe what Alex isn't seeing in perspective is that this junior is three years ahead of him, right? This junior probably had all summer maybe to learn this piece. Alex doesn't know what that junior went through to get to the point where uh, this junior is able to play that well. So Alex isn't looking at the full picture. He has been getting the full focus here. Alex, again, going back to the evidence, Alex, as we know, they have, um, they have these awards and honors. So we know that they have talent. And Alex is only, thank you, Sophia. Alex is only at the beginning of their journey though. That's right, that's right. And that is the perspective there, right? is only there. So we can look at that and then having Alex acknowledge, I'm sorry, I'll just looking at the, the chat as well. Also, this journey is different than that of the junior. They have different lives and have different goals. Yes, yes, that's exactly right. 
So the key things here that I guess to take away, and I don't want to get, okay, we're we'll kind of taking time, is it's the, the key is here to focus, to think about your perspective on what it is. It's easy to look at Alex and think, oh my gosh, he's, he does have talent. He's just getting overwhelmed by what he's seeing around him. That thank you, the, the skill doesn't take away from there. And that's right. So the key to perspective, knowing that Alex is on his own journey, that Alex does need to talk about his feelings out so others can, so that he can hear what his thoughts, what that negative self-talk is and have some positive self-talk for him. 